people have disagreed. They've had their own opinions about certain things and they've disagreed. And that, that is still here today as well. The difference is throughout history, um, throughout American history mainly, when two individuals disagreed, the way that they solved it is majority of times they would have a discussion, they would uh, debate in some instances and state both their sides and respectfully disagree. Nowadays, instead of that, it seems like the two parties just want to yell at each other and tell them why the other person is wrong. And that's what I've actually faced a lot of times whenever I've been here at this campus. Um, I bring up an opinion that I have and I'm berated and chastised over my opinion without a logical argument being made against my opinion or anything like that. And the topic that people get frustrated with most of the time off of my opinion of it is the death penalty, capital punishment. Um, I, if you do not know, am pro capital punishment, pro death penalty. Um, and whenever I say this in classes, I haven't said it in this class, but whenever I've said it in previous classes, I am met with basically how dare you um, have that opinion. And whenever I ask for a discussion, doesn't really turn into anything. So, I, I've always done policy debates, I've always done mock trials, I've always had conversations. And obviously I'm doing a persuasive speech today, so it's not a conversation. Um, and I don't like the format of persuasive speech, just how people normally do them. Um, people normally come up and they say, here's my opinion, here's why I'm right, here's why you should agree with me. I don't like that. I like the other side being said. So in this speech, I am going to give the other side's opinions, the other side's beliefs on the death penalty. I will say why I think that those opinions are wrong, but I do want to give the other side a chance just so y'all can hear it. Um, going into the speech now, the first thing we have to do is define what the death penalty is. Um, the death penalty, or known as capital punishment, is a form of punishment inflicted by the government upon individuals that commit severe or heinous crimes. Um, in history, there have been many ways that capital punishment has been um, performed, but nowadays it is most of the time done by lethal injection. And just to give you a statistic, last year in 2023, 24 individuals in the United States were given the death penalty. So that's a well-rounded, here's what the death penalty is, just a quick synopsis of it. Now what we're doing is these are majority of the arguments that are made for anti-capital punishment, and these are my arguments for capital punishment. And the first argument, I'm going to start with the anti. Um, the first argument is that individuals state that it is racially biased. Um, this is a common argument because in, in the past, the death penalty has been racially biased. Um, I will not deny that. But nowadays, it's not. It statistically is not. According to the death penalty database, there have been 1,512 executions since the year 1976. Of those executions, 55% of them were Caucasian whites, with 34% of them being African Americans. At the same time, 76% of death penalty victims are Caucasian whites, with 15% being African American. Um, African Americans have a higher rate of being, uh, of their appeals succeeding in death penalty trials as well. So statistically speaking, it's not racially biased. The, the other argument is that it violates the Eighth Amendment, and again, I'm, I'm a law major, so I know this, it does not violate the Eighth Amendment because of Coker v. Georgia. Coker v. Coker v. Georgia was a Supreme Court case that was held in Georgia, and the Supreme Court said that the death penalty must be proportional to the crime committed, otherwise it violates the Eighth Amendment. So, nowadays, somebody that commits murder is eligible for the death penalty because that's proportional to the crime. That's what the Supreme Court said. Um, so those two are probably the most common ones, but one of the ones that is interesting is wrongful convictions, and this is one that a lot of people 
feel sturdy about. And when they talk about wrongful convictions, they majority of the time talk about Joe Artie. And I don't know if anybody's heard of Joe Artie. Not many people have, unless if they're arguing against the death penalty. Joe Artie was a 23-year-old man that was accused of sexual assault, rape, and first-degree murder. When the police brought him in, he, his confession was coerced. They, required, they forced him to confess. They forced him to sign a paper. What the police didn't know is that Joe had autism, so he didn't really understand what was going on didn't really understand what he had just signed, and his IQ was under 40. So he had, an, I believe, it was a 38, I can't remember exactly, but I believe his IQ was 38. Um, he ended up being convicted of first degree murder and first degree rape, and was sentenced to death, and that death penalty was carried out on January 6, 1939. In the 2000s, DNA proved that Joe did not commit the crime that he was accused of. And ultimately, his name was pardoned, his, his name was restored to being a non-criminal. People say that wrongful convictions, if the death penalty didn't exist, he would, he would still have been able to live a life. The difference, the argument I have is he still would have been put in jail, no matter what. Um, because of all the bad procedures that took place. Also, nowadays, DNA is here, and DNA has prevented many, many, many crimes uh, from having wrongful convictions. Statistically, when DNA was discovered, wrongful convictions dropped by 83%, statistically. And since DNA also was discovered, uh, wrongful conviction appeals have been mass overturned. So people that were wrongfully convicted have now been released out of jail. Now some of them spent 40 years in jail and that is wrong and the government ended up trying to make that as right as they could. And that's a whole nother discussion. But again, statistically speaking and policy speaking, the government has put things in place, and one other thing that they put in place is an IQ requirement to be eligible for the death penalty. To be eligible for the death penalty in the United States, you have to have an IQ over 70%. Joe already nowadays would not be eligible for the death penalty because of his IQ score. Because he, if he did commit the crimes, didn't understand the crime that he committed. So, that I believe is my argument for wrongful convictions. And the final one is people that are anti-capital punishment state that it is morally wrong. And this is something that I cannot rebut because it is a personal opinion. Um, people who are religious say that it goes against the Bible. People that are not religious say that it's just wrong to kill individuals. Um, you can't pay, you can't fix death by giving death. That's what a lot of them say. Um, and I can't rebut that. That's their personal opinion. And I wanted to put that on there because there might be some of you that have that opinion. And the difference is, instead of yelling and berating you, I will respect that opinion, and I do understand that opinion. I have a majority of the people that I talk to have that opinion. Um, but that's my argument against the anti-capital punishment. And now I'm going to go to pro-capital punishment, why I believe capital punishment should exist. And it's two simple reasons, protecting law-abiding citizens, and it reduces crime. And I'm going to start off with it protects law-abiding citizens, and how I believe that it protects law-abiding citizens is Kenneth McDuff. Kenneth Allen McDuff was arrested off of a three first-degree murders in uh, 1972. And he was found guilty of all three of those murders. These three people at the top were his first three victims. He was found guilty of three counts of first degree murder and was sentenced to death in the state of Texas. But three years later in 1975, the Supreme Court said that the death penalty was un unconstitutional and his death sentence was overturned to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole. He was serving life in jail until in, in the 1990s he was released because of prison overcrowding. At 
that time, Macduff went on to kill at least 12 more women, believed to be 60 plus women. So, when he was arrested again, they sentenced him to death, and that process was carried out on November 17th, 1998. And since November 17th, 1998, Kenneth Macduff has not killed another person because he's not able to. You see, my argument that it protects law-abiding citizens is because Kenneth Macduff was not given the death penalty back in the 1970s, these confirmed people and believed to have been 60 plus more women lost their lives because the government would not give this man the death penalty. But when they finally did, since 1998, this man has not been able to kill another human being. So it does protect law-abiding citizens. It does prevent men like this from committing the same heinous crimes again. The uh, next stance that I have is that it reduces crime. And I'm going to bring up a story that I think everybody in the world knows, and that is Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy is probably the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history, probably in world history. Um, he killed many, many women, believed to have been over a hundred women. But what people don't remember about his story a lot of times is that he was arrested, was being charged for murder, and then broke out of jail and went on to kill at least three more women, believed to be over 20 more women. So, this is, he hadn't been sentenced yet, but was on trial for it. So, look at, he broke out of jail. Kenneth McDuff was released from jail, but Ted Bundy broke out of jail and went on to kill more people. So, it reduces crime within the categories that the death penalty is eligible because by giving the death penalty to somebody that will do it again, you inherently prevent them from committing more crimes. Same thing that I said with Kenneth McDuff. Um, but I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to give you a non-serial killer because people say, well, serial killers, it's evident that they would do it again. Well, first degree murder is also rel it, visible that they would do it again. Asaro Geary, many of you probably have seen the documentary, um, The Trial of Gabriel Fernandez. And if you don't know the story of it, this is Gabriel Fernandez. He was an eight-year-old boy born, born in the year 2005, same year that I was born. And he ended up being tortured by his mother and his mother's boyfriend, Asaro Geary. Asaro Geary would beat him, put him in a chest of drawers, make him sleep in there, um, shoot him with a BB gun, burn cigarettes on his skin, burn them out. And this was a school picture that Gabriel Fernandez had taken of him. Gabriel Fernandez's body was found in their home and this was all the ligature wound marks that were made to Gabriel Fernandez. Asaro Geary was arrested along with Gabriel Fernandez's mother, Pearl Hernandez. Both of them were arrested and charged with first degree homicide with a special circumstance of torture. Pearl Fernandez had an IQ under 70%, so she was not eligible for the death penalty. She ended up taking a plea deal with the state of California to get life imprisonment with the possibility of parole. Asaro Geary did not get that same opportunity and was given, sentenced to death after being found guilty. Asaro Geary had a history of domestic violence, had a history of child abuse. And because nothing was done to prevent it, now I'm not saying that for child abuse alone, he should have been given the death penalty. But what I am saying is he did have a pattern of doing it. And if this man is not given the death penalty and gets out of prison, what is he going to do when he gets out of prison? He's going to go straight back to what he's been doing the rest of his life, abusing children and committing domestic violence. 
And these stories that I told you are not just a select few stories. This is a young Marine that was killed and murdered, beaten up brutally by a man, and that man now has walked out of jail. He was released. Guess what that man did two days later? Went and killed another person. So this man's life was forgotten by the government, and it ended up costing another young man his life. Everybody probably knows these individuals, the Idaho murders. Um, the man that is on trial right now is believed to have killed more individuals previously. People say that that man is innocent. I'm not sure. But if he is guilty of this crime, and if he is guilty of the previous crimes, he is a continual murderer. He continues to commit the same crimes. This woman was killed once again, by a man that had been arrested for first-degree murder, and then he was released 